Um, Tom referenced his father and grandfather. I'm going to mention mine briefly again. He was a man of uh, great passion, great intellect, great love for baseball. He valued greatly his friendship with Buck Weaver, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, he went to his grave proclaiming his innocence. Uh, Patricia Anderson lived with uh, Buck and his wife after, well after the uh, verdict had arrived and his banishment had taken hold, and we'd like her to talk about what it was like for this man who'd uh, been deprived of his, love, of his livelihood and been deprived of the only living he had ever known, and uh, how he coped with that as, as he went on and uh, made a living for himself. Welcome, Patricia. As Buck's direct descendant, you're a guest of honor. Thank you very much. Uh, my uncle, I think the best way I could describe it, he was heart <clears throat> excuse me, heartbroken by his banishment from the game he loved. The people who knew him said he came alive when he came on the field, always with that big grin on his face. All he wanted was to play ball. It was his life. He never gave up trying to get his name cleared. He always thought that if they would clear his name, he could get back to playing. He wasn't that old when he was banished. But even if it went on a little further where he was just a little too old to start playing, he would be the coach because he was really very good at the game. Uh, he also, they asked uh, if what his activities were after he was thrown out of baseball. Well, he had money saved when he was playing ball. And uh, my father had uh, some drug stores. He was a pharmacist, and he invested in some of them. He had a florist shop, which I don't think went any place particularly. And then he and Helen opened a sandwich shop. And uh, my aunt told me they uh, were too generous with their portions, so it wasn't long before it just folded. And then when depression hit, he lost almost everything. He worked at anything he could find. He was a good mechanic. Uh, he, well, in a little bit later years, he played, uh, he was out at the race trucks being a very mutual clerk. Uh, and I remember he did some painting for the uh, buildings in Chicago, some of the big buildings. He was a painter there. He wasn't afraid of hard work, he'd do anything to turn some money. Because after the depression hit, <clears throat> my father had died, and he took my mother and my sister and myself, <clears throat> excuse me, in to live with them. Because my mother had no uh, formal training to go out to get a job, like if she was a secretary or, or something on that order. She had been in show business. She was in show business with her sisters. They had a, a all-American girl quartet in vaudeville, and that isn't exactly uh, something you put on a resume that I was a singer, at least not unless you had Las Vegas to go to then, and she was not Las Vegas material. So they, uh, we were so, we were so happy that we had a home with him. And then they asked me about how the family reacted to books and movies related to the Black Sox. And, of course, some of them we found pretty interesting, but as a family, we could always find a few things that we didn't quite agree with. But writers have a little leeway, and I think sometimes, especially like when they wrote for the screen, a movie, they wanted to make it just that little bit more exciting to the public. And maybe they didn't think Uncle Lux was exciting enough, but he was. So. Uh, they want to know if we disagreed on some things, not a lot. The movie that John Cusack played his buck in, he did a very good job uh, playing him. But there was a few things when I was watching and I thought, no, Buck wouldn't do that. But it was acceptable because the writers had worked it in, so it looked like a natural thing for him to do. Um, and they also asked, uh, about my sister's crusade. My sister Betty Scanlon was a newspaper reporter for the Sun-Times. She worked for them for many years. And she knew quite a few of the sports writers, and some of them would write a real nice article about Buck. They'd see him someplace and they'd go up talk to him. And, and uh, Warren Brown was one. He wrote uh, about the face in the window. He'd gone out to the racetrack and he saw Buck at the $50 pair of mutual window. 
So he hadn't seen him in years. He went over to talk to him. So that was a very nice article he put in there because he said that uh, he'd always believed Buck was innocent. And he said, here's a man who is still trying to clear himself and still believes that he's going to be able to do it. Uh, and then there was a few, I, I don't remember the name of a couple of the other sports writers, but she thanked them. She said it was helped her a lot because she wanted some people to get interested in clearing Buck. And then my cousin Marge Fallon in Pontiac, Illinois, uh, she was related to Buck through my aunt, and she was almost a rabble rouser. She got very vehement about Buck and what people should listen to and uh, what she would tell them about him and that they should do something. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember which uh, commissioner it was. I think it was it Faye Vincent that came after Landis? Or was there another Ford one? Ford Frick. Ford Frick, okay. Well, not him, but the one that came after was it might be Faye Vincent. She? Happy Chandler. Happy Chandler. Chandler, okay. Happy Chandler, right. And she almost drove him crazy with all the letters she kept sending <laughs> and writing. And the same with the commissioner now. He really got tired of hearing from her. And someone said they heard him comment one time, what, another letter from Follett? But she wasn't about to give up. She wanted them to do something about Buck and, and to get something going. Uh, and the two of them are gone now. So it was, uh, excuse me, it was left up to me to carry the torch. And, um, I was able to do that when Dr. Fletcher contacted me, and he started that Clear Buck Dot campaign, uh, and it just looked like maybe, now maybe something would come of it. Maybe some, enough people would listen, and enough people would either write in or want to know why something hadn't been done to help this man. And then they asked me, <laughs> what I thought about Pete Rose, and I said, I think for my family and myself, it's better left to be unsaid. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you this, did he, did he lose his love for baseball? Did he continue to follow, I mean, he what, did he feel betrayed by it? Did he continue to follow the White Sox and the game in general? Uh, if he followed the White Sox, I wasn't aware of it. He never talked to you at home about, you know, baseball, well, like in front of my sister and I, because he didn't want us to think that things were really bad. And, but we knew something was going on sometimes when he'd come back home and he would look so depressed and he'd come in and he'd try to get that grin. And he would, he would just say, I'm kind of tired. And he'd walk into his bedroom in my hand and say, he saw the commissioner again. Nothing happened. Would, or else he wouldn't see him. So, no, he always tried. He wanted, oh, he wanted so bad to be back in baseball. He saw himself as a coach in later years. He just, and he would, he actually, I can't, wish I could remember the name of some of those fellows that, that he gave a leg up to teaching them or showing them how to try to pursue a career. Uh, he, he loved doing that. And he uh, coached the girls' softball league, the Bidwell Bluebirds, during the World War II. And they were pretty good. I went to watch it, and I didn't know girls could play ball that good. But he was out there and coaching them and uh, hitting balls to them and he, doing his pep talk like he used to do when he played regular ball. Uh, he was thrilled that he got that. He did, baseball was it. Uh, he would do any kind of work, and he'd do anything for anybody. But if he could have had anything to do with baseball, he was in seventh heaven. He did a lot of coaching. Kids. Yes, I mean, there was times, well, <clears throat> he walked to work usually, and where we lived in Winchester, he actually worked at Halstead, which was a pretty good long walk, but he'd take his time, he allowed himself enough time to walk up, because some of the, the empty lots along the way there were quite a few, everything wasn't built up that much, <clears throat> and he'd watch the boys, and he'd go over and, and show one of them that he was holding the bat wrong, or how to throw the ball, or whatever. <clears throat> and of course, a lot of them knew who he was, and they, they liked the fact that he was willing to help them. And uh, with any kids that wanted anything from baseball, if they would ask him if he could help them, he would. It was his life. That was all he ever thought of. He was the only one of the eight to remain in Chicago. But uh, Ray yeah. Schalk and Red Faber were 
Did he see them at all? Uh, well, he, he went out to uh, Shock's bowling alley sometimes, visited him with Ray. He was a good bowler. He was good at anything athletically that he did. Uh, Red Faber, I know he came out to the house a few times to visit, but I don't remember that much about him. I was, uh, I was one of those dumb girls who didn't think much about baseball. I didn't understand it, so who wanted to bother going watching it? And I never told my uncle that. I would not do that. But I just didn't think there was anything to baseball. And people say, your uncle is a baseball player. And to me, they said, a baseball player, it came to mind was the kids out there playing ball in all the empty lots. That's a baseball player. And I had never gone to a regular baseball game. And uh, I know one time he told me, he said, well, I'll, I'll buy some tickets for you and Betty to go. And I said, well, give them to Betty. I don't care. <laughs> that disappointed him. He would have liked me to like baseball, I think. And I didn't really start liking it until I got old enough to get a little sense and realize what a good game it is. And, uh, well, to me, the most wonderful thing that could happen is if the commissioner would pay attention and clear him, give him his good name back. Did you feel uh, you accomplished anything you know, last year during the All-Star Game when all the dignitaries were here that well, your committee was very visible? Did you feel as though you accomplished anything? Or, or I think some of, of getting the, the word out? Some of the uh, dignitaries approached us, and I mean, we got to talk to them. But the thing that thrilled me the most was uh, at the Sox Fest. And I don't know if I, what all the people know here what, what it is, and they have the... Um, all these booths and where they have a lot of famous players willing to sign autographs, they would line up for, it seemed like miles, but it wasn't. And uh, just information on all different aspects, main, mainly of base, uh, White Sox baseball, but there was others kind of too. And I was sitting there in the booth, Doc had, and this young team of uh, what do you call it? Little, little thank you. I always forget. I always forget that. <laughs> there was this young team of little eaters, and I didn't ask them if it was their father or their coach that brought them, but they were going around. I kind of saw them out of the corner of my eye in a few other areas, and I got such a kick out of it because they were they go up and look at some of these well-known players, and they, I mean, their faces. Well, oh, you know, it was just like they looked at God, and. Um, they came over to see, talk to me, because I don't remember if it was Doc's wife or Irv's wife told him, that's Buck Weaver's wife, got a niece over there. She lived with him. Why don't you talk to her? So they approached me like I was going to fall apart, because in the papers in the booth uh, that we handed out on Buck, it also gave his birth date, which was 1890. So they probably figured I wasn't real far past that. And wow, is that an old lady? So they wanted to be very careful of what they said to me. And I told them when I was born. And so I said, it's all right. You, you can't you know, hurt me. But we talked about the game. They loved it. They never knew anything about Buck till they came to that uh, you know, meeting. And not meeting, the, what do you call it? Sox Fest. Sox Fest. Sox Fest, thank you. And uh, they were just enthralled, reading all these different things about him. And then I told them from my perspective of what it was to grow up with someone like that. And I said, it's, it is one of the worst things that ever could happen to a man, to what they did to him. Take his game away, well, take his dignity away too, because they, he just lived baseball. And uh, he didn't leave Chicago because he had, of course, his wife was my mother's sister, Helen, and uh, she she stayed here. That was her town. They originally, originally born in Pontiac, Illinois, but uh, my mother was here, and Buck got very friendly with my dad. They were like chalk and cheese, but they became very close friends. And then, of course, he had a lot of other friends in Chicago, and he, he loved it here. This He didn't go back to where he was born because he very seldom ever visited uh, Pennsylvania, Stowe, and then it was Pottstown. Uh, but uh, Chicago was his town. I think a lot of people thought he should have left because of what they did to him, the, you know, uh, some of the Chicago people. 
but that was he never he didn't believe in that he believed that and it was true from the amount of uh and art not autographs <laughs> signatures thank you signatures that they got after that came out and they had that trial they passed around all kinds of papers for signatures for buck they were going to start a campaign they got thirty thousand signatures from the people of chicago to do something about him that it wasn't right so he knew that there were a lot of people in Chicago that loved him and believed in him. So he wasn't about to run away because he, he, he didn't do anything that he was ashamed of. He loved Chicago. It seems to me the uh, history that I'm familiar with suggests that his only crime was maybe going to one of the meetings and not uh, going to uh, Kid Gleason or Mr. Kavisky and telling them what was going on. And for that, he was uh, found to be as complicit as, as the guys who were in on it. I guess I would ask Tom and, and Dave if that squares with their uh, knowledge of the situation. No. He went to Kid Gleason. Maybe it didn't come out in anything else, but he went to him. And he just told him, no, Buck, I'm not handling it. Nothing. That's true, but Patricia's talking about he didn't go to Kid Gleason. But the, the thing is, everybody knew the fix was on. I mean, who was he going to tell? Uh, you know, basically, it was a situation where Major League Baseball was trying to make a rebound economically, and it would have been economic suicide to go off, off the World Series. And another thing is, what I've seen from the research is that Buck didn't believe his teammates were going to go through with it. They didn't. He didn't think that they would do it. Uh, I would just point out. I would just point out that uh, Jackson never attended any of the uh, players' meetings uh, discussing the fix, uh, and it was only Lefty who came to Jackson afterwards and threw the envelope at him full of money. But of course, Jackson's acceptance of the money, uh, you know, was clearly an immoral act and probably illegal as well.